we are contending with the state from whence we spring, with those who were once our fathers, our brethren. Victory, however decided, must be fatal, and whichever side prevails must weep over its conquests. James Duane, Continental Congress. By the summer of 1775, both the British and the Americans had cause to weep over their losses. More than 100 men had died at Lexington and Concord. Two months later, one-seventh of the king's forces in New England, more than 1,000 men, were shot down near a place called Bunker Hill. Now, in June, the remaining 6,500 British troops were trapped in Boston, surrounded by 20,000 rebels. This was no longer a family squabble. George Washington had not even learned of the battle at Bunker Hill when he set out from Philadelphia to take command of the rebel army outside Boston. All along his route, crowds came out to cheer the first American commander-in-chief. He looked every inch the general. In an age when riding was the highest form of athletics, Washington was perhaps the best horseman in the colonies. His uniforms had been expensively tailored to show his powerful physique to its best advantage. Understand, in an era when maybe the average male might have come in at around five foot eight and maybe about 145 or 150 pounds, George Washington was 6'3", 225. He could have played linebacker in the NFL. He understood how to use that commanding physical presence to provide the moral authority. And he worked almost all his life at enhancing that image. Washington's public image concealed the private fears he revealed in a letter to his brother. I am embarked on a wide ocean, boundless in its prospect, and from whence perhaps no safe harbor is to be found. I have been called upon by the colonies to take command of the Continental Army. I am thoroughly convinced that it requires greater abilities than I am master of. In his career, Washington had led men in only two small battles, and now he was taking charge of an army of amateurs. He arrived at Boston, and his first reaction was one of, oh my God, what have I gotten myself into? The chaos and confusion. It wasn't only the lack of disciplined troops that discouraged Washington. As soon as he reached camp, he ordered an inventory of gunpowder. When he discovered there was only enough for each man to fire nine shots, he was speechless for half an hour. He was short on cannon, muskets, and powder. Washington commanded an army that could not fight. In the north, other colonists were going on the offensive against Canada. The northern colonists had always longed to annex Canada as a 14th colony. Now it seemed a necessity. Canada was a British possession an ideal base for launching attacks on the colonies. Washington also coveted Quebec's military supplies. He described them as the largest stock of ammunition ever collected in America. Leading the attack was Irish-born Richard Montgomery, at 37, the youngest major general in the American army. 
He was a British officer who came to New York in 1772, settled down to be a farmer in 1773, married the daughter of Judge Robert R. Livingston. Uh, they were madly in love, at least according to Janet, who referred to him as her friend, her lover, and her husband. Janet reports in her diary that she woke from a terrible dream in which her husband uh, was killed by his own brother. And when she rushed to his side as he was dying, he didn't know her. Uh, her husband's response to this was, you know that our happiness won't last and we have but a short time together. To support Montgomery, Washington chose Colonel Benedict Arnold to lead a second army to Canada. Arnold planned to take more than a thousand men to Quebec via the rugged route up the Kennebec River, while Montgomery advanced up the more accessible Lake Champlain corridor. Arnold was relying on a 10-year-old map to guide him 350 miles all upstream through the main wilderness. When Arnold set out to try the backdoor march to Quebec, he was attempting with a large military force to do what nobody except a very, very small exploring party had ever done before. They really didn't know beyond some general rules of thumb where they were going. It was late September by the time Arnold gathered his troops and supplies. The air was already chilled by the approach of winter, but Arnold set out anyway. Before long, the expedition's boats, hastily built of green wood, began to come apart. Then the food ran out. Arnold's troops began to eat their cartridge boxes, their shoe leather, their shaving soap. After six weeks, nearly 400 turned back. The rest struggled on through waist-deep, freezing water. Many of the company were so weak that they could hardly stand. When we attempted to march, they reeled about like drunken men, having now been without provisions five days. I passed many, set and wholly drowned in sorrow. My heart was ready to burst and my eyes to overflow with tears when I witnessed distress which I could not relieve. Private Abner Stocking. On November 9th, eight weeks after the expedition set out, the survivors finally saw their target, Quebec. Arnold pitched his camp just out of range of Quebec's guns. He had little gunpowder and no cannons. Quebec was the most heavily fortified stronghold in North America. Though he was outnumbered two to one, Arnold demanded the city's surrender. The British and Canadians, amply supplied, stayed comfortably behind their walls and waited for the invaders to starve or freeze to death. Then on December 2nd, Montgomery arrived with a supply of powder, several cannons, and an ambition equal to Arnold's. In spite of the odds against them, the two commanders decided to attack under cover of the next snowstorm. The freezing days dragged on. The sky remained clear. Finally, on New Year's Eve, just hours before most army enlistments would expire, a blizzard struck. The Americans crept toward the city, but an alert sentry heard the crunch of their footsteps in the snow. Arnold and Montgomery charged into a hornet's nest.
musket ball broke Arnold's leg. Still, he tried to lead the attack until his men finally persuaded him to limp to a surgeon a mile away. Montgomery was shot through the head and died instantly. His widow, Janet, would live another 52 years and never remarry. When the battle for Quebec was over, the British had suffered only 18 casualties. 426 Americans were captured. 60 more were killed or wounded. The Americans failed to take Canada, failed to capture any weapons, and failed to close off a dangerous artery of invasion. By the end of 1775, Americans had been at war for nine months, but they still disagreed about what they were fighting for, reconciliation or independence. Even in the rebel headquarters, some of Washington's officers still raised their glasses to their leader, George III, King of England. The sun never shined on a cause of greater worth. Tis not the concern of a day, a year, or an age. Posterity will be affected, even to the end of time. The writer of those words was an Englishman who had immigrated to the New World only a few months before the clash at Lexington and Concord. He was self-educated and penniless. At age 38, Thomas Paine had been a tutor, tobacconist, grocer, and corset maker. And he had failed at everything, except troublemaking. While he was in London, he enjoyed taking on everyone as a kind of uh, 18th century Socrates. He was in the marketplace arguing with everybody. He became a tax collector, was fired from his job when he was uh, caught handing out petitions to members of parliament asking for higher pay for the tax collectors. In London, Payne's appeals on behalf of underpaid civil servants caught the attention of Benjamin Franklin, who was there as an agent for several colonies. After meeting Payne, Franklin recommended him as an ingenious, worthy young man and sponsored his immigration to America. Once in Philadelphia, Payne began to write a pamphlet promoting the radical idea of American independence. Thomas Paine had suffered all his life under England's class system, and he spared no venom in his writing. In January of 1776, after virtually every typesetter in Philadelphia had refused to touch his treasonous work, a rebel printer finally agreed to publish it. Common Sense was its down-to-earth title. In its 47 pages, Paine attacked the notion that England's king should be seen as apparent to the American colonists. He set out to dethrone the sacred institution of monarchy. This is the most prosperous invention the devil ever set on foot for the promotion of idolatry. In England, a king hath little more to do than make wars and give away places. A pretty business indeed for a man to be allowed 800,000 a year for and worshipped into the bargain. Pain, I think, virtually destroys the notion of monarchy. Uh, as a form of government, which is really uh, surprising because no one had been attacking monarchy and the colonies. It wasn't a political issue. And his arguments seemed to be so persuasive that virtually no colonist, with the exception of the Tories, ever advocated monarchical rule again. When it came out, 
Common Sense sold 120,000 copies in the first three months. And over the course of several years, it sold half a million copies. This was the equivalent, or almost the equivalent, of the Bible, uh, the Bible sales in colonial America. It was quite phenomenal. Common Sense was read aloud from street corners and pulpits in taverns, parlors, and schools. The brilliant pamphlet was published anonymously. People speculated it had been written by Samuel Adams, John Adams, or even Benjamin Franklin. A Connecticut man wrote an open letter to the unnamed author. You have declared the sentiments of millions. We were blind, but on reading these enlightening words, the scales have fallen from our eyes. Tom Paine was saying in this pamphlet what a lot of people were now thinking but had hardly dared to say out loud. In other words, that the colonists were at war with England. Outside Boston, George Washington's army was still locked in a stalemate. But the impatient commander was about to find help in the form of a portly, enthusiastic Bostonian named Henry Knox. Knox realized that the deadlock could be broken by artillery, and there were heavy guns already captured and lying unused at Fort Ticonderoga. We sometimes think of Henry Knox as being a rather old man from the paintings that exist, but in fact, Knox was only 25 years old when the war broke out and he became commander of Washington's artillery. Knox had no military experience. In fact, he had been a bookseller in Boston and was probably the best read American on the art of artillery warfare in the 18th century. In the dead of winter, Washington ordered Knox 300 miles northwest through ice and snow to Ticonderoga. The ingenious Knox had a plan for turning the season to his advantage. Dragging heavy artillery, especially without very unique types of gun carriages constructed for it to move it, is a very hard thing over the very poor frontier area roads. But if you go in winter, you can put them on sleds and drag them across the snow. In December, Knox left Ticonderoga with 59 cannons and mortars, 120,000 pounds of equipment. He wrote to Washington that he hoped to present a noble train of artillery in 16 or 17 days. Six weeks later, Knox arrived with his noble train. Washington chose Dorchester Heights, overlooking both Boston and its harbor, to mount his cannon. But first, he had to fortify the heights, and the ground was frozen. Instead of digging trenches, the inventive rebels prefabricated their defenses, timber frames packed with hay, and hauled them into place overnight. By dawn on March 5th, 1776, the anniversary of the Boston Massacre, Dorchester Heights was bristling with guns. General Howe thought it would have taken his army three months to build the same earthwork. In point of fact, as soon as Washington mounts the heavy guns, Boston is untenable and Howe has to evacuate. And it's because the heavy guns can sink the ships and without the ships, Boston can't be defended by the British. Howe had been outmaneuvered. He sent a message to Washington. If the Americans would let him evacuate Boston in peace, he would not burn the city. Washington held his fire. He had no choice. He had the guns to shell Boston, but not the gunpowder. His entire fortification was a masterful bluff. On St. Patrick's Day, 1776, 9,000 British soldiers and 1,000 loyalists set sail for Nova Scotia. 
George Washington triumphantly entered Boston, only to find that the Redcoats and their collaborators had ravaged the city. The general did not hide his disdain for the Loyalists. One or two have done what a great number ought to have done long ago, committed suicide. With fewer than 20 men lost in the entire eight-month siege, Washington had run the British out of Boston. They would not see the inside of that city, the birthplace of the revolution, for the rest of the war. After nearly a year of war, the Americans still had not declared their independence from Great Britain. By John Adams' reckoning, only one-third of the colonists were for the rebellion. Another third were against it, and the remaining third were indifferent. The image that the American Revolution was a spontaneous mass uprising of united souls who uh, po possibly from birth yearned to be an independent nation is not at all true. Far fewer people were willing to break with the king. Some didn't really feel that the revolution was merited. Even within Congress, meeting at the Pennsylvania State House, some delegates still argued for mending the rift with England. But soon, the radicals pushing for independence would get an unexpected boost from King George himself. In January of 1776, ships arrived from England carrying the past year's news. The king had announced to Parliament three months earlier that he was gathering a huge force to crush the rebellion. On June 7, 1776, Congressional Delegate Richard Henry Lee, a tobacco planter from Virginia, rose to offer the inevitable resolution. That these United Colonies are free and independent states that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown. They wish to make a declaration of independence, not only for the sake of the civilian population who would see this break, would realize what it was for and would support it, but perhaps above all, for foreign opinion, so that other countries could formally note that these colonies had set up their own independent government and therefore, crucially, could negotiate with foreign governments, could contract alliances, and could receive aid. Congress appointed a five-man committee to draft a Declaration of Independence, among them Benjamin Franklin and John Adams. But none of the senior members wanted the tedious job of writing it. The document itself, they believed, would be an historical footnote, a technicality. So the task was foisted on the committee's youngest member, 33-year-old Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson didn't want the job either. His mother had recently died, and he had just returned from Virginia after being bedridden for six weeks with a migraine headache. Nevertheless, during two hot June days and nights in a second-story rented room, Jefferson bent over his portable writing table and produced the first draft of the most enduring protest document in the history of the free world. Jefferson's words, though magnificent, were not wholly original. He borrowed from his Virginia neighbor, George Mason, who in turn had borrowed from the 17th century British philosopher John Locke. Just weeks earlier, Mason had written in the preamble to the Virginia Constitution that all men by nature are equally free and independent and have certain inherent rights, namely the enjoyment of life and liberty. There's nothing new in the Declaration of Independence. If its arguments hadn't been familiar and understandable 
it wouldn't have been a very powerful document of justification. What you might say was radical about it was, after all, it was an initial formal statement of the first of the modern revolutions against king, government, and an established legitimate constitution. After nine hours of heated debate in airless rooms, Congress passed the Resolution for Independence. Thirteen separate English colonies now called themselves the United States of America. The delegates voted on July the 2nd, 1776, a date John Adams was certain would go down in history. On July the 4th, the President of Congress, John Hancock, was the first to sign the treasonous document. In just 79 words, Jefferson defined the ideals of the newborn nation. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it. Although the man who wrote the Declaration of Independence championed the ideal of equality, Jefferson himself owned nearly 200 slaves. More than a third of the 56 signers were slaveholders. With the exception of one Catholic, all were Protestant, white, and men of property. They did not include most of the population of America in their new freedoms. Neither women, nor blacks, nor Indians, nor white men who had no land to their names. In London, newspapers decried the hypocrisy of a land of slaveholders declaring equality. One account portrayed a South Carolina clergyman praising the declaration while his slave held a parasol over him with one hand and fanned him with the other. But throughout America, the birth announcement of the fledgling nation set off riotous demonstrations. George Washington had the declaration read aloud in camp. In New York City, a rebel mob pulled down the statue of George III and had the two tons of lead melted into 42,000 musket balls. As patriots celebrated the declaration, Benjamin Franklin's oldest son began serving a two-year prison term. William Franklin, the last royal governor of New Jersey, refused to renounce the King of England and was pronounced an enemy to his country. The elder Franklin never once visited his son or tried to help him. The bond broken between William and Benjamin Franklin was one of the countless ties severed by this ever-widening war. The week the Declaration of Independence was approved in Philadelphia, 100 miles away, New York's harbor was growing white with sails. One observer described a forest of trimmed pine trees floating towards the city. The largest force that ever sailed from Great Britain, 32,000 soldiers, 10,000 sailors, and 52 warships was gathering to crush the rebellion in a single campaign. To make certain of it, the British had hired 8,000 of the best trained and most feared soldiers in the world. 
Hessians from Germany. Because they were mercenaries and because they didn't care anything about the land which they were sent except that they were supposed to fight there, they behaved with enormous, enormous indifference and enormous brutality. After an entire year as commander-in-chief, George Washington faced his first battle. But without a navy, New York was the worst possible setting for his baptism of fire. It strategically was an extremely difficult, in fact, really an impossible place for Washington to defend. Manhattan Island is an island, obviously. Long Island is an island. And the British had absolute naval superiority. But Congress insisted that Washington defend New York City. Against General William Howe's army of professionals, Washington could field just 19,000 soldiers, and only a handful could be termed professional. Many were militiamen, untrained and untried. Many were short-term recruits, like 15-year-old Joseph Plum Martin, a Connecticut farm boy. Soldiers were enlisting for a year's service. I did not like that. It was too long a time for me at the first trial. I wished only to take a priming before I took upon me the whole coat of paint for a soldier. Joseph Plum Martin entered military service while he was still only 15 years of age. He was living with his grandparents in Milford, Connecticut, not very happy living there. He faced a hard life of work on the farm. Uh, he was looking for adventure. He felt that it was an obligation of young men to serve in the military. After learning that his first battle would be for New York, Martin discovered a patriotic fervor. I was told that the British Army was reinforced by 15,000 men. I did not care if there had been 15 times 15,000. I should have gone just as soon. The Americans were invincible in my opinion. The rebel army may have looked invincible to a young private, but Washington and his generals had failed to reconnoiter the battleground. Not so the British. General Henry Clinton had spent his youth in New York when his father was the royal governor. He took it upon himself to survey the American defenses on Long Island, and he found their weak spot. The forward American line was thinly held by 3,000 troops, and a pass to the east was undefended. Clinton devised his strategy. While part of the British Army preoccupied the Americans, the main force would slip behind them and close the trap. Against 3,000 rebels, Clinton planned to deploy 20,000 troops. On the morning of August 27th, one soldier wrote that the sun rose with a red and angry glare. Shortly after dawn, the British and Hessians launched their diversion. We came upon a very large body of the enemy and offered them battle in the true English taste. The British began a very heavy fire from their cannon, now and then taking off a head. Our men stood it amazingly well. An American soldier. One hour after the fighting began, the Americans heard the roar of cannon behind their lines and realized they were surrounded. Now the Hessians, with bayonets fixed, closed in. The Americans were very worried about how they would withstand bayonet charges. And certainly in the early battles of the war, the British, when they were able to fight the Americans in the open field and were able to use their favorite tactic of bayonet charges, it usually did succeed in scattering the Americans. They were not able very effectively to resist. 
The British had told the Hessians that the Americans would show them no mercy. And so the Hessians gave none. The greater part of the riflemen were pierced with the bayonet to the trees. These dreadful people ought rather to be pitied than feared. They always require a quarter of an hour's time to load a rifle. And in the meantime, they feel the effects of our bayonets. Colonel Heinrich von Herringen. To buy time for his men to escape, General William Sterling, with 250 troops, counterattacked. Sterling was described as fighting like a wolf. Five times the Americans charged. Five times they were driven back. sent in reinforcements, including the regiment of Joseph Plum Martin. But the battle had turned into a rout. By the time we arrived, the enemy had driven our men into the creek. Those that could not swim sunk. The British were pouring the canister and grape upon the Americans like a hail. When they came out of the water and mud to us looking like water rats, it was a truly pitiful sight. On Long Island, the Americans had fought their first formal battle and lost. On the British side, 400 soldiers were killed, wounded, or missing. But Washington lost nearly 1,500 men. The Americans were now trapped on Long Island with their backs to the East River. But hours passed, and the British did not attack. Here was where the legacy of Bunker Hill occurred. General Howe was in a position uh, to destroy Washington's army if he moved quickly. But Howe hesitated. He wanted more information. He wanted more men. He paused, and when he paused, a storm blew up. The day after the battle, a heavy rain fell all day and through the night. While it fell and the British waited, Washington began to round up boats. The concept of evacuating an army from a position like Brooklyn was almost unthought of in European terms. Therefore, the British don't expect it. The Americans, the brash young men, don't know you're not supposed to be able to do it. So they go out and do the thing because nobody told them it was impossible. At dawn on August 30th, three days after the battle, sniper fire from the American camp mysteriously ceased. General Howe sent out a patrol. It soon returned with an astonishing report. George Washington, with 10,000 men, had vanished in the morning fog. As George Washington abandoned New York City, his officers debated burning it down. In the end, both the commander and the Congress said no. And the British moved into their comfortable winter quarters. But just after midnight on September 21st, 1776, fire did break out. No alarms could be rung. The rebels had taken the town bells to melt into ammunition. As the blaze spread, so did rumors that it was started by the Patriot Underground. From his camp on Harlem Heights, Washington watched as a fourth of the city turned to cinders. The day after the fire, the British captured a young American spy. Nathan Hale was an interesting man. He was tall and apparently very athletic and agile. 
When the war broke out, he joined Washington in uh, New York, and when they asked for volunteers for an intelligence mission, unfortunately for Nathan Hale, he volunteered. Hale had almost finished sketching the British defenses when he was betrayed by a loyalist named Samuel Hale, his own cousin. When questioned by General Howe, Hale confessed freely. He was sentenced to be hanged the next day. Nathan Hale was a very brave man who used that scaffold to talk to the militiamen. And he said, um, don't worry about me and don't be afraid for your own life. And he was reported in the New York papers as saying, if I had 10,000 lives, I would give them all for my injured, bleeding country. When newspapers published the account of his execution, Nathan Hale became the very symbol of patriotic sacrifice. He was 24 years old. In the fall of 1776, the British were preparing an invasion from Canada to finish off the rebels. There was only one obstacle in their way, Benedict Arnold still chafing from his defeat at Quebec. Arnold planned to mount a naval blockade of Lake Champlain. The lack of a navy didn't discourage him. Arnold simply built one. Arnold knows to beat the British that year, all he has to do is keep them from getting to Ticonderoga. He doesn't have to beat them in battle. He just has to string it out and make it take time. So he starts the building race to get the warships on Lake Champlain. In three months, Arnold built a fleet of 15 boats and recruited 800 men. The British met his challenge by adding 25 warships to their own fleet. Arnold sailed his makeshift navy behind Valcour Island and waited in ambush. At noon on October 11, 1776, the British flotilla found him. And the battle began. Arnold fought with a fury. Lacking trained gunners, he aimed some of the cannons himself, even while directing the fray. By dusk, the American fleet was shattered. A third of Arnold's own crewmen were killed or wounded. All of his boats were damaged. The British anchored and prepared to finish off the Americans come morning. But in the morning, Arnold was not there. Carried on a light breeze, he slipped past the royal fleet in the night. In the end, Arnold lost most of his boats, but he accomplished his mission. It was now too cold for the British to march south, and they withdrew to Canada. This year, there would be no invasion. Benedict Arnold had bought his countrymen another season to fight. 250 miles to the south in New York, Washington's army was retreating for the fourth time in nine weeks. The men were very much fatigued and faint, having had nothing to eat for 48 hours. One of the men near the colonel complained of being hungry. The colonel, putting his hand into his coat pocket, took out an ear of Injun corn, burned as black as a coal. Here, he said to the man complaining, eat this and learn to be a soldier. Joseph Plum Martin. The last of Washington's troops arrived at the meadows of White Plains on October 27th. And on the 28th, Howe attacked. Once more outnumbered and outflanked, 
Washington managed to escape across the Hudson River into New Jersey. Three thousand men remained behind at Fort Washington. Nathaniel Greene, its commanding general, feared that abandoning yet another post would devastate morale. He assured Washington the position was strong. But a spy had taken detailed plans of the fort to the British, who knew that the rebels were cut off from reinforcements. On November 16th, the British and Hessians encircled Fort Washington. From New Jersey, Washington witnessed one of the greatest disasters of the war. 3,000 soldiers and officers, one-fourth of his army, were captured, along with 161 cannons and 400,000 musket cartridges. The general who argued for holding the fort, Nathaniel Green, confessed his mistake. I feel mad, vexed, sick and sorry. This is the most terrible event. Its consequences are justly to be dreaded. Washington moved his remaining men deeper into New Jersey. All during the long retreat, a volunteer soldier wielded his pen at night by the light of campfires, using a drum for a writing table. As Christmas approached, Thomas Paine presented to his countrymen a gift of stirring essays called The Crisis. These are the times that try men's souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will in this crisis shrink from the service of his country. But he that stands it now deserves the love and thanks of men and women. Tyranny, like hell, is not easily conquered. Yet we have this consolation with us, that the harder the conflict, the more glorious the triumph. After two months of retreat, Washington reached the outskirts of Trenton, New Jersey, with only 3,000 men. George Washington's forces had been chased out of New York, and across the river into New Jersey, and down through New Jersey, across the Delaware, when it seemed as though uh, his army was reduced just to a few hundred, uh, support had melted away, soldiers had left, militia had left, and it seemed as though Howe on the one side and Washington on the other were in agreement that the revolution was at an end. A week before Christmas, George Washington, despondent, wrote to his brother John. Between you and me, I think our affairs are in a very bad condition. Not so much from the apprehension of General Howe's army as from the defection of militia. If every nerve is not strained to recruit the new army, I think the game is pretty near up. The soldiers' enlistments would expire at the end of the year. With his army about to vanish, George Washington had exactly 13 days to produce a miracle. Spinning wheel to buy. 